Hi, I'm Dev. And I'm Cam. And you're listening to Criminalish, a true crime podcast where two best friends trade stories ranging from the wild and wacky to the downright messed up. Do you love listening to the Criminalish podcast? Want to hear more from Kim and Dev? Then consider becoming a subscriber for $2.99 a month. Subscribers will have exclusive access to minisodes, Dev and Cam's live reactions to crime shows and documentaries, as well as early access to any multi-part episodes and so much more. Click the link in the show description if you're interested in subscribing. See y'all in Cell Block C. So today, Cam, we will be discussing the murder of Abraham Lee Shakespeare, which took place in April of 2009 in Tampa, Florida. And if it's in Florida, you already know it's about to be wild. So have you heard of this case before, Cam? It does sound familiar, but I can't remember any of the details. Now, funny enough, I had heard about this case years ago, and It was one of those cases I heard on those Saturday mornings watching Snapped with my mother. And it popped up in my recommended feed recently. And I just remember this case gave me all the feels. So I was like, we have to, we have to discuss it. Yeah, I know Snapped always has the wild stories. And there are those cases where I may not remember all the details, but I remember how it made me feel. And so I definitely can relate to wanting to go back to it and learn all the details again exactly so first things first abraham is one of the brothers and we're finally covering a case that involves the ups and downs of a black man and ultimately the tragic loss of his life and i just want to put out there the fact that i absolutely love the name abraham lee shakespeare like i like i feel like you have to be the coolest dude alive if you have that name like for some reason that just really That's a really solid name to me. Yeah, that name just comes with like built-in swag. You walk a little different. (laughs) Yes, yes, I like it. And I know he went by all three. (laughs) It wasn't Abraham. It wasn't Abe. No, my name is Abraham Lee Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Full name, government only. So I want to go over a few trigger warnings with this case. I will be discussing child neglect and alcohol abuse, as well as brief discussions of suicidal ideation and sexual assault. None of these topics will be thoroughly discussed, but they are important to the case. And finally, what you drinking tonight, friend? So friend, tonight I am drinking some Sauvignon Blanc. From line 39, I went to the liquor store today and with the week I had, I was like, I just would like to end my week with a nice glass of wine and some true crime. Fun fact, that was one of the names we were thinking about when we were trying to name the podcast, (laughs) but it was taken. It was taken already. (laughs) True crime and wine. True crime and wine. We don't endorse them. We don't not endorse them. We just don't know about them. So listen at your own discretion. I'm better they took our name. It was our name. (laughs) Speaking of true crime and wine, what you drinking, friend? So tonight I am drinking the Apothic Red Winemaker's Blend in the style Rich and Smooth. And it's a red wine tonight. Um, I actually saw this wine on a commercial And the marketing, whoever did the marketing for this wine, you need a raise because you got me. I watched that commercial. I said, wow, that looks sexy. That looks fun. And now I need to have it. Thus, I went to Publix and bought it. It wasn't expensive either. I think it was like $16, $18, something like that. And it's a really good red wine. Love it. And it's not super bitter like a lot of red wines are. It's a little bit of a sweeter red. So I feel like if you think you don't like red wine, you would really like this red wine. 
They ain't sponsoring us, but I like this red wine. So this is for y'all. <laughs> Specialty for y'all. I'm dead. So Mr. Abraham Lee Shakespeare was born on April 23rd, 1966 in Seabrum, Florida. And unfortunately, his home life was very unstable. And he and his family had a very hard time while he was growing up. He grew up in poverty. His mother was described as an alcoholic who neglected him. And his father was mostly absent from his life, meaning Abraham had to fend for himself from a very young age without much or any adult guidance. And as a result of all this instability in his life, Abraham actually dropped out of school after seventh grade and was unable to read or write beyond a 12-year-old comprehension. That's so unfortunate. You know, children deserve to be given every single chance and all the opportunities. And sometimes they're just born into households where they are set up, not necessarily for failure, but they're they are not set up for success. And they really have like so many things working against them. Yeah. And it's so unfair. It's so unfair to put a child through that. Did Abraham have any siblings? I do not think so. I think he was an only child, but different reports say different things. So as Abraham got older, he worked several odd jobs and tried to make ends meet as best he could. He worked as a truck driver and a laborer, but he struggled to make ends meet and spent much of his late teens and early adult years homeless. And unfortunately, Abraham also spent a brief amount of time in prison in relation to some burglary charges. But as you may know, Poverty and crime tend to go hand in hand as sometimes criminal activity seems like the only way for individuals suffering from homelessness to make ends meet. But also, in many cases, homeless individuals will commit crimes to purposely get arrested and go to jail because they see it as a place to sleep that's not on the streets and it includes guaranteed meals which is just so sad and often why you see this continuous cycle of people going back in prison or in jail to avoid the hardships of homelessness. It's really tough because at at least in prison there is some sort of structure. It is up in the air. You can't really sleep. You don't know who's around you, what's around you. Aside from all the noise, it's a safety thing too. You don't feel safe. And so it's it's very unfortunate that our society allows people to get to the point where prison is a better option than their current situation. But for Abraham, it sounds like it wasn't for any violent offenses. Yeah, you're exact. You're exactly right. And by all accounts, Abraham was kind, quiet. He was introverted. He was also generous to a fault. And he was described as the type of man who would give his last dollar to someone else if it was going to help them. So because of this, I agree that I definitely think his crimes were related to meeting his needs and there was no malicious intent. And he was never arrested and never charged with anything that was violent. I want to make that very clear. So his friends said that he spent that time in jail and it made him a very hard worker, and he left jail determined to turn his life around. From the day he left going forward, he lived a straight-edge lifestyle, meaning he did not use recreational drugs or drink alcohol, and he would later have a child in 2000 with his girlfriend, a little boy. So let's take a moment to appreciate a Black man taking back control of his life. Yeah, especially, like, struggling with housing issues and housing insecurity, I understand why they are on drugs. Like you dealing with the stuff that they go through, it makes sense. They need some escape. And so the the fact that he was able to cut out drugs and alcohol is truly amazing. Absolutely. So in 2006, Abraham is now 40 years old. He has a steady job and has taken back control of his life. In November of that same year, Abraham and a coworker named Michael Ford were driving down to Miami when they stopped at a gas station because they needed to refuel. 
While there, Abraham asked his coworker to buy some lottery tickets, and Michael went into the store, bought two lottery tickets, one for himself and one for Abraham. Now, Abraham didn't use this lottery ticket immediately. He actually just put it in his pocket and just kind of kept it for a couple of days. But a few days later, Abraham scratches the lottery ticket and he wins $30 million from the Florida lottery. Three zero million? Three zero million. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Shoot. I'm quitting, moving. I'm a brand new person. Look, hello. I'm going to be walking different just because I can. Exactly. You was calling me A before? No. Say the full name. Say the government. I'm Abraham Lee Shakespeare. Abraham Lee if we're friends. It's Mr. Shakespeare to all of y'all. Yes. <laughs> so his life is forever changed by this winning of the lottery. And Abraham actually opted for the option that pays you out in one lump sum as opposed to paying you out over time. And after tax, because of course the government is going to tax your winnings, hate to break it to y'all, he takes home $17 million. Wow, that's still a good chunk. Still a good chunk. So in 2006, the Florida lottery actually requires winners to disclose who they are and the amount which they won. And for Abraham, this comes in the form of being on camera, essentially a news segment that shows, look at Abraham Lee Shakespeare, winner of $30 million, which I'm sure you can understand why this is a terrible idea, but we'll get to that in just a little bit. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen exactly, but I'm surprised nothing like that happened before, considering y'all were saying, oh, watch the news to see who just got some money. Exactly. And it's 2006. I'm sure his name was in the yellow book. Oh, of course. Of course. So remember Michael Ford who bought and gave Abraham that lottery ticket? Mm-hmm. He actually took Abraham to court and tried to say that Abraham actually stole that winning lottery ticket from him. And because Abraham allegedly stole this lottery ticket, the money actually belonged to Michael and Michael was entitled to Abraham's winnings. No. Cause you know what, you know what I could, you know what I can see happening? Him going, Hey man, you know, like I, I bought you that ticket. Can you, can you cut me off some? And it being being like, you know what, bro, you're right. You did buy me the ticket. You know, if you wouldn't have bought me this ticket, I might not have had this. So here's like, in like 30 K 50 K something like that. Like give it a nice chunk of money. But I feel like this man did not ask nicely. And he was greedy and he wanted all of it. Oh, baby, we went to a whole trial. A whole trial took place over this money. So you already know he didn't ask nicely. And the jury found in favor of Abraham. So Abraham got to keep his millions. Period. So after receiving his $17 million lump sum and dealing with Michael, Abraham bought himself a $1 million home bought himself a couple of hundred thousand dollar cars and traveled to his heart's content. As he should. Yes. Yes. Some reports say he would take long cruises and vacations and he would take all of his friends and family and pay for everything. And that's how I know Michael didn't ask nicely. Yes. <laughs> Cause with that in mind, if he would have asked nicely, I'm sure that man would have given him at least like 20 K. He probably would have given him a million in all honesty. Yeah. If you had just asked nicely. Kindness will always get you further than hatred. So Abraham is living his best life. He's pulling things together. But of course, people out the woodwork were coming out to ask Abraham for money. And because Abraham was a kind person and a very generous giving person, he would give hundreds upon thousands upon millions of dollars to other people. And Abraham himself said he felt like he didn't have any friends and he didn't have any support system because the only people who were calling him and the only people who were talking to him were the people who needed his money. And those people included people that Abraham 
didn't even know. Yeah, that's sad. That's why I actually would not like to win the lottery. Or I would not like to win it in a state where it's public knowledge that you won the lottery. Absolutely. It's so unsafe. And this goes back to what I was saying before of the negative side effects of being forced to publicly announce your full name, your image, and your winnings. And it's actually been pretty well documented that winners of the lottery tend to spend every cent and return to having no money within a couple of years, or they are the victims of scams, crimes, and just general manipulation. And unfortunately, Abraham was no different. He, like many others, fell into this wealth and became a victim of a lot of scams, a lot of frauds, and like you said earlier, long lost cousins, siblings, relatives, everything. And by 2008, less than two years after Abraham won $17 million, he had burned through $16 million dollars and was living on the last million dollars of his earnings. And not only was it financially draining on Abraham, it was mentally and emotionally draining on him because he was extremely depressed and he didn't feel like any of his friends or family really loved him and that they really wanted to be around him just because he was a good guy. He felt like they only wanted to be around him for his money. And he was fearful that any potential friends or family he did have would disappear the day his money ran out. And that fear was probably well-founded because I feel like you can tell when people are really using you. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm like, I, I'm, I am grateful and I'm happy that I can trust in the people around me like that. And so I, I really resonate with Abraham's feeling like y'all are really only around me because y'all need something for me. And the minute I can't give y'all that, y'all are gone. It's sad to live like that and know that you don't really have anybody by your side. Yeah, to kind of know that to somebody else, you're disposable. Exactly. So with the money running out and Abraham's fears of losing everything, he comes across someone who seems to care about him, to care about his financials, to care about his overall well-being, and is finally willing to put their foot down and get Abraham back every cent he is owed by the people who borrowed or flat out stole money from him. And that woman is Doris Dee Dee Moore. So Doris' nickname is Dee Dee. So I will interchangeably use Doris and Dee Dee throughout this episode. But please know that if I say either, I'm talking about the same woman. So Dee Dee in Abraham's eyes was a successful businesswoman who was financially responsible and independent. And her expertise was in stabilizing finances. And Abraham's finances needed stabilizing. Because remember, Abraham also dropped out of school at 12 years old. So he doesn't know the ins and outs of how money works, how budgeting works, how much things actually cost and what that means. So Dee Dee, in a lot of ways, swoops in and saves his finances. And just after a few months, Abraham puts Dee Dee solely in control of his finances and he trusts her fully with everything affiliated with his money. Wow. And so I'm sure she had like brought up credentials and, and stuff like that. Um, but also, I think Abraham was searching for somebody like that because she seemed like exactly who he was looking for. I'm sure that he has some blinders on. I honestly don't even think it necessarily is him having blinders on. I think it's a matter of you don't know what you don't know. And she's coming in and telling you, oh, this is what investments are. And this is what a 401k is. And this is what stock is. And she's telling you all these things and you have a you have a seventh grade education. You don't know any better. So in a lot of ways, on paper, he did exactly what you should do. When you don't know what to do, when you don't know what you're talking about, you put it in the hands of somebody who does. And she presented herself as somebody who knew what she was doing. 
And initially, Dee Dee is in her bag. She is working for Abraham. She went after the people who owed him money. She showed him what these investments are, how they were growing, what they were doing, how to set up a portfolio, all these things she did for him. And initially, he saw the returns. He saw the money coming back in. He saw the investments working out. He saw all of this. And I feel like to him, she gave him that baseline understanding of finances that he was denied growing up. Because even as somebody who sought after higher education, I don't know a lot about finances. I don't know a lot about investments and offshore accounts and stuff like that. I don't know what millionaires do with money. So if I suddenly fell into $17 million, I too would look for somebody to handle this for me. So I think he did what he was, quote, supposed to do, end quote, but it just didn't work out how it should have. Yeah. I do remember seeing this case on investigation discovery. Um, and yeah, I, I remember, I do remember some of the details now, but I think with financial education, like so many black families are not given that. Even when you have both parents in the household. And so I, I understand why so many people that come from poverty, that come from hard circumstances, when they do come into a lot of money really quickly, they blow it because they don't know what to do with it. It happens to a lot of athletes, too. Exactly. It does happen a lot with athletes. People who are not used to having a lot of money, when they get it, they spend it. Exactly. People don't understand how expensive it is to be poor. Because you don't feel secure having that money because you're like, oh, it's going to go anyways. Let me spend it on something that I want. And you're not thinking, oh, well, if I invest it now, I can actually grow it by 1.5%. They're worried about what they can do with the money now, not two years from now. And again, too, especially if you're especially if you're living in poverty, the instability in your life and not knowing what's going to happen funnels that fear of like, this money is just temporary. And I think that was present even in the first thing Abraham bought when he got this money was a house. Right. He bought a place that is his. He bought a location that nobody can take away from him. I think that says a lot. Side note, me and Cam are not financial advisors. Y'all be smart with your money. Go look it up. Go ask somebody. Go get a smart financial advisor if you need one. Get a financial advisor. Yes. Get you a smart financial advisor and do whatever you need to do to protect your assets. Even if you think you don't make no money. If you make more than $5,000 a year <laughs> and you would like some help managing it, get you a financial advisor. If you're in college, you can actually get one for free. Go to your university. Most places you can, I have my financial advisor is free. Love it. There you go. So everything is seemingly going a lot better for Abraham. His financials are in a better place. But suddenly friends and family of Abraham notice that they're seeing a lot of Didi collecting all this money on Abraham's behalf, but they're not seeing a lot of Abraham. And on November 9th of 2009, a cousin of Abraham finally reports him missing because according to Abraham's family, they had not physically seen or heard from Abraham since April 7th of 2009. Seven months? Almost seven months to the day. And he was right. Because how were you by my side? You ain't heard from me in seven months and you're not thinking anything is weird? That's crazy. It's so unfortunate that you proved him right. Because also, Abraham was more passive. So when he was just letting y'all run all over him, y'all were all in his face, blowing up his phone, everything. Mm -hmm. But he, <laughs> but he, for lack of a better phrase, six his guard dog on you to get his money back. And now don't nobody want to talk to him. And the people who hadn't heard from him includes his mother, who he had forgiven and rekindled a relationship with, and his eight-year-old son, who he had a very, very close relationship with. And trust and believe that despite everything going around, Didi was there and Didi was collecting money. 
So before we get further with the story, let's take a moment to talk about Miss Doris Moore and who she was. So Doris D. Moore was a native of Plant City, Florida, which is about 45 minutes to an hour outside of Tampa. She grew up in your standard middle-class white family and was born in 1972. I do not know her exact birthday. And after a fairly normal childhood, she went on to study nursing and graduated in 1991. And she began working as a nurse's assistant almost immediately. In 1992, she got married and she had a child, a son, in 1995. And after working as a nurse's assistant for nearly a decade, she decided she wanted to branch out and become an independent businesswoman. Now, unfortunately, her businesses came in the form of MLMs, which are multi-level marketing, if you don't know, also known as a pyramid scheme. And I just thought this bit was funny, but it includes OG MLM herself, Miss Mary Kay. Yes, ma'am, Dee Dee sold Mary Kay. So in addition to selling Mary Kay, she had quite a few other businesses over the next few years, including a cellular company, which we will dive into in just a little bit. So unfortunately, none of these businesses panned out and went exactly the way that Dee Dee had hoped. And... In 1999, she was actually arrested for shoplifting. And this 1999 arrest seems to put Dee Dee on a path that will explain a lot of things in this case. So later in 2001, she was arrested for writing bad checks when attempting to pay her car note. And she would also later be arrested for insurance fraud and falsely reporting a crime. And just a little story time with that, she got those charges when that car that she wrote the bad checks for, she couldn't afford it. She couldn't afford that car note and she needed to get rid of this car. So she tied herself up and she threw herself in a ditch on the side of the road. And when a car drove by, she ran out in the streets, flailing her arms around, panicked, to get this driver's attention. And she said she had been kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and her car stolen by three Hispanic men. Bro, her and Miss Sherry, oh my gosh. If y'all don't leave these Hispanic people alone, they are doing nothing but minding their business and drinking water. What is your problem? Doing nothing to y'all. Why do they have to be Hispanic? They always have to be Hispanic. They always have to be Hispanic, Cam. Hispanic or black? Hispanic or black? You know, racist people be thinking all Hispanic people are in the the cartel. True. And racist people also think that if they say a black person, the police are going to be like, yep, that makes sense. We're not going to look into this further. Black people, yep. And another thing, I am always personally offended when people have the audacity and unmitigated gall to say that they were sexually assaulted when they weren't. That is so disrespectful to victims who have to suffer and deal with this for the rest of their life. And you just make it up to make your story believable. You're disgusting. If you wanted to lie, you don't have to say that they assaulted you. Exactly. You can say somebody stole your car. You can say somebody held you at gunpoint. Those are traumatizing events in itself. But you don't have to take it to... Not only did they pulled me at gunpoint and steal my car, but they also assaulted me and they beat me up and they tied me up and they threw me in a ditch on the side of the road. Like, what? <laughs> what is wrong with you? And not only did she spin this whole story, but she went to the hospital. She contacted the rape crisis center and she told the police this whole thing. And of course, at the time, she was a blonde white woman. So the police launched this big investigation to look for these three Hispanic men. This is wasting resources. Wasting resources. I hate it because when there are these women that are trying to tell their stories, people are always like, oh, well, they're women that lie. They're women that lie. Even though it's such a small fraction of the cases. Exactly. But it's stuff like this that fuels those other people. They're like, oh, well, this person lied. So why, why should I trust you? 
uh, it's just it's so and that's and that's why it pisses me off so much because your lying just completely fractures any foundation built on believing victims on believing women on believing people i'm not actually going to say women just believing on it fractures any foundation that has come from me too in just believing people's story and believing victims because i i wish that police would mount this kind of search effort would use these resources when other people come to them with these stories but instead you demand evidence when a woman of color especially comes in and says that she was assaulted you demand evidence and the police launch this investigation and of course it's all over news outlets woman assaulted by three hispanic men and her car stolen right and a few days later the police receive a phone call from a man and he's like hey uh Dee Dee's car is in my front yard she gave me $500 to hold on to it for her. And now she's saying it's stolen. So her plan was to hide her car and report it stolen so that she could stop the car from getting repossessed. What was she going to do after? You know these people don't be thinking these plans through, Cam. How dare you want a well thought out plan? This isn't an anime. Lord Jesus, what was she going to do after? That car is in his front yard. People, police looking for the dang car. $500 is not going to keep me from going to the police. In all honesty, if you want my opinion, and this is speculation on my part, I think she wanted to frame him. Was he Hispanic, do you know? I don't know if he was Hispanic, but I do think that she left that car with him and that eventually the police would circle back, boom, 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 on the front door, you know. And arrest him. She would go in and give her little victim statements. Like, yes, officers, that's him. Ruin that dude life forever. And I 100% believe that if he didn't get a chance to make that call and say that, no, I have this car. Dee Dee's my friend. She gave me this money. Blah, 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 blah. Would have screwed his whole life up. So in addition to this, we're not done with Dee Dee's antics. Because in 2001, she and her husband were sued by their landlord for not paying rent. And she told her landlord that she could not pay rent because she had just fired one of her employees and that that employee was coming after her and was on her property setting his contract on fire in her front yard and stalking her. And he was so scary. And she was so stressed out because of all the fear from this ex-employee that she was not able to pay rent. If I'm the landlord, I'd be like, okay, girl. Okay, girl. What's that got to do with my money? Right. Run me my check. Because it sounds like you got extra money because you're not paying this person no more. It sounds like you need to move anyway. So it sounds like you need to pay this closing fee and get out. Exactly. Exactly. So her landlord said, forget that. He kicked her and her husband out. And she owed him... $3,500 that she didn't pay. And fun fact here, she also owed a radio station $20,000 from ads to sell her cell phone company before she declared bankruptcy on everything. Yeah, so she was racking up them bills. Racking up that debt. Racking it up. And she was not done, Miss Ma'am. In 2004, she created a new company thinking that this one will be the one. And this company was called American Medical Professionals, LLC. And they were a nursing staff agency that essentially provided in-home care and assistance to different facilities. Think like a manager. She was basically a manager for a nurse. And this business is actually successful. And this business is making her $200,000 a year. So she's doing good for herself. She's making good money. She's back on track. And everything seems to be going good, right? Well, unfortunately, Dee Dee has not let go of her trifling ways just because she has come into some more money. So Dee Dee's next scam venture was to scam potential business owners out of money. So, for example, in 2006... A couple gave Dee Dee $60,000 
to set up their business and do all the background information. And she pocketed all that money and did no business set up for these people. And unfortunately, there was no contract or anything in writing in place when she did this, which she was well aware of. And that couple just lost that money and they never got it back. And Dee Dee did this to several people on top of the fact that she's making $200,000 a year from her business. So she's just greedy. Yeah, just greedy. Because you're making good money. You're making more than enough money to support yourself. Because also by 2006, she's a single woman. So how is $200,000 a year not enough for you? She had divorced her husband and was moving on with her life as the scammer that she was. But Dee Dee really looked at herself as a rags to riches kind of girl who pulled herself out of the trenches to make all this money that she was making. And she was talking to a friend of hers about writing a book on her success. Is she not a successful scammer? I, yeah, you're right, actually. She, she was a successful scammer. And Dee Dee is looking for testimonials and other experiences to include in her book. And a friend tells her about Abraham's story about a young black man who actually came from nothing and had come into this money and had seemingly pulled a lot of his life together. And that is actually how Dee Dee found out about Abraham. And then that is where she reached out to him, showed all her credentials, gave him this false sense of security and took over his entire life. So that concludes all the background information on Dee Dee and who she was and how she met Abraham. And now that she has wormed her way into his life, she not only was taking over his finances, but after divorcing her husband, she lived in the $1 million home with Abraham. Mm -mm. So now we're gonna get back to our original timeline where the cousin has made this call claiming that Abraham is missing. So after the cousin made this call, of course, police are doing their investigating and they find out about Dee Dee. So the police go to Dee Dee at the $1 million home and they ask her, when's the last time she saw Abraham? And she was like, I talk to Abraham all the time. He's fine. He just needed to get away because he was tired of everybody running after him for all of his money. And he was tired of, you know, people just using him. So he left the house to me and he's out on vacation just trying to get away. He doesn't want to talk to y'all. He only wants to talk to me. So after that interaction, the police are like, yeah, that feels not right. Something about that feels off. And police start doing a little bit of investigating and they find that all of Abraham's assets are in Dee Dee's name. Every single one of them. His house was now in her name, which later she claims she bought it from him and they just did a private sale. Because again, remember, he was going off to sip margaritas in the Caribbean. So he doesn't need a home anymore. And the police were also able to find the documentation of seemingly Abraham handing over all of his assets, his cars, his house, his bank accounts, his investments, his money, all over to Dee Dee. And not only that, the police also discovered that there's this little thing called Abraham Shakespeare LLC in guess whose name? Not his name on the LLC and her name on the papers. Please. Of course it belongs to Miss Doris Moore. Surely you're kidding me. I wish I was, Cam. I wish I was. Wow. And at this point, remember, it's November. So p police are discovering all of this stuff in November. So as they continue to investigate, police spoke with everybody Abraham knew. And again, no one had seen him since April. But they had seen Dee Dee. And Dee Dee had told several versions of where Abraham was. First is that he was going to Jamaica. Then it was, no, I actually think he went to Miami. Well, you know, I actually thought that he was really interested in going to Barbados. 
everybody heard a different version of where Abraham was from Dee Dee. So because this story is not making any sense whatsoever, police also go get the phone records of Abraham's phone. And Abraham was one of those people who used his phone 24 seven. He was always on his phone. He was always taking calls, especially because everybody was blowing him up asking for money. But all of a sudden, all communication to his cell phone stops on April 6th of 2009. All of it. And the only person he is actively carrying a conversation with in April of 2009 is Dee Dee. And it would later be determined that that text conversation was coming from the same location. So she was using his phone? Yep. It's also sad that nobody else was texting him. It's not that nobody else was texting him. The only conversation he, quote unquote, was engaging in was with Dee Dee. Conversation in terms of there was back and forth. Correct. Okay, got it. So again, just another bit that is not making any sense whatsoever. But then on December 27th, miraculously, Abraham's mother gets a call from Abraham. And he calls her and he's like, hey, Ma, it's been rough. I just needed a break. I need to get away. I'm all right. Y'all chill out. Everything will be fine. And Abraham's mother answers that phone. And she says, who the hell are you? Because you are not my son. And on the phone, homeboy's like, yeah, no, this is Abraham. I'm just letting you know I'm all right. I'm good. Everything's fine. So police track down the caller and the number associated with this phone. And shockingly, this leads to a man named Greg Smith, not Abraham Lee Shakespeare. And Greg tells police that Dee Dee paid him $5,000 to call Abraham's mother and pretend to be Abraham, which this part of the case pissed me off because you really had the audacity to just grab any black man off the street and tell him to talk to a, a black woman and then think that his mother was just going to believe that some random black man off the street was her son? Just because they sounded similar to you, you don't think his mom is going to be able to tell the difference? BFFR. BFFR. If I call my mother and I say hello wrong, she like, what the hell is wrong with you? But also this is another example of blatant racism because apparently you just think all black men sound alike exactly and i think he is caribbean because you just think if this is i'm gonna go with jamaican because that was the first thing that popped into my head he may not be jamaican but if you just think every man with a jamaican accent sounds the exact same there's your problem yeah because that's what i remember from the episode is that not only did he try to imitate his voice he also tried to imitate his accent yeah and somebody who's from that country is going to be able to tell whether or not you're really from there. Like, BFFR, girl, please. Audacity. It's a lot. I need to up my audacity because these women that we be covering be having way too much audacity. So Greg immediately tells the police everything. And Greg is also like, hey, if you need somebody to, you know, be a rat, I will be your rat. I take payments in cheese. And after the police speak to Greg, they name Dee Dee as a person of interest in the disappearance and possible murder of Abraham Lee Shakespeare. So Dee Dee is now aware that she's a suspect and panic is rolling in. And for some reason, she calls Greg and she's like, do you happen to know anybody who is willing to take a murder charge? Now that you mention it, yes. Let me call up my other friend who was just telling me, you like, he was like, bro, I'm just in the mood to take a murder charge. Let me know if you let me know if you know somebody that wants me to take a murder charge for them. Like what? That's crazy. And so remember at this point, Greg is working with the police. But the fact that she would ask that is crazy. Absolutely. Absolutely. But Greg is like, damn right, I gotta do. He going to jail for the rest of his life anyway. I got you. So Greg is like, yeah, I got a dude who'll take the fall for you. But I need you to tell me and him everything in depth. Tell me everything that happened down to where you were standing, what your toes were doing. 
because if I'm gonna make this believable and he's gonna take the rap, we got we gotta know everything. And of course, Greg calls the police and they set up an undercover cop to have this conversation with Dee Dee. So then Dee Dee meets up with her intended dude who's gonna take the fall for her, aka an undercover cop, and she asks him, What do you want for this? And the cop says, I want fifty grand. Dee Dee's response, can I make it in payments? Why she said, you got PayPal, you got Klarna, you got Afterpay. Do Hitman take Afterpay? A payment plan with no interest, preferably, please. That's wild. And in that same interview, she tells this dude that he's going to be famous and that he's going to be on Oprah. And he's an absolute legend for taking the fall for her. Why would Oprah have a murderer? Please, I beg, like, come on. And at the same meeting, she tells him everything. What happened, the altercation, everything that took place. And most importantly, she tells them where Abraham's body is. And a few days after this ordeal, she gives Greg the murder weapon. And she leads Greg directly to where Abraham's body is. And because Greg is working with the police, the police show up a few hours later and dig up a slab of 30 by 30 feet concrete sorry, in Hillsborough County on property that is owned by Dee Dee. And when they dig up this slab and break everything apart, they find the remains of Abraham Lee Shakespeare. And upon an autopsy, it was found that he was shot point blank twice in the chest and left under that slab of concrete for months. Now, police believe that Abraham was murdered by Dee Dee over his money because they find out that in January of 2009, just a couple of months after putting Dee Dee in charge of Abraham's finances, she transferred $250,000 of his money into her business, which is the American Medical Professionals business, and paid off all of her debt associated with that business. She also bought herself a new car in his name and forged his signature and also forged a signature to make Abraham Shakespeare LLC. And then she faked his signature to remove his name from all the accounts. So remember when I said before how she had all that paperwork of him seemingly signing everything away to her? She forged all that paperwork. Did it not require a notary? The stuff that Siri is not require a notary? Isn't it the whole purpose of having a notary? You can do a notary privately. Like hire your own notary? But that notary is still, they still have to, you know, they still have to abide by certain laws. They do, but if Dee Dee's stealing a quarter of a million dollars from this man, it wouldn't surprise me if she paid off somebody to notarize some stuff for her. I'm glad that she was dumb enough to tell every single detail to not one, but two people. Absolutely. And the saddest part about all of this is she did all of this when Abraham was still alive because Abraham goes to the bank in March and attempts to withdraw some money and he can't. And I think that's when he started to realize that this person who I had put all my faith in is not actually on my side. And it is police's opinion, as well as my own, that he went to confront her about this stolen money, about him not having access to her account. And he went to confront her about it and she shot him point blank to steal all of his money and assets. And another bit of this that aggravates me, in my opinion, this this piece right here shows premeditation 
because in early April, Dee Dee films a video of Abraham and she's asking him like, don't you hate it that people are always hitting you up for money? Don't you just wish that you could go away for a little while? Where would you go if you could leave? It's exhausting, isn't it? Having to deal with all these people. Oh, yeah. She been playing in that. That's crazy. She been playing in that. And in this audio, you can hear him say, yeah, I do hate that people use me for money. I do hate that nobody really seems to be on my side. I do hate that. I don't care where I go. I'm not a picky guy. I just don't want to be here. Do you get tired of people asking you for money all the time, Abe? Give me your opinion on it. I've been to a year ago. You're just ready to start living your life, huh? They don't take no for a answer, so. And just let them keep on and keep on acting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So where do you want to go to? It don't matter to me. I'm not a picky person. California. You want a foreign country? Cozumel. Hmm? Yeah. Well, how do you like how do you like your, are you gonna miss your home? Yep, I miss it, but life goes on. And when people were first asking questions about where is Abraham, where's Abraham, where's Abraham, she showed them this video to be like, Oh, I talked to him. Look, he's he doesn't want to be bothered with y'all. He wants to disconnect and he wants to go out and do all these other things without y'all. He just needs a break from society. And she just kept up lie after lie after lie to keep making excuses as to why people didn't see Abraham. And one of the lies being that he was assaulted by a sex worker and was in the hospital. So he couldn't come to some scheduled meeting that he had with the financial advisor. So Dee Dee was there on his behalf. Yes, this is a real story she just made up when this man was already dead and buried under that concrete. Why couldn't you just have said he was sick? Because if you just say he's sick, you don't villainize him. You don't ruin his character. You don't ruin him in the eyes of others if you just say he's sick. But if he's out with a sex worker, you can try to frame him as a bad person. You can fulfill your little narrative of what a black man is supposed to be. So I'm sure your biggest outstanding question right now is, how did Abraham end up under that concrete? I have many questions, but yes, that is one of them. Well, the answer is she got her ex-husband James to dig her a hole in another mansion that she bought with Abraham's money. Now, James says he did not know he was digging a grave, And considering the fact that he didn't get any money or kind of payoff from this, I believe him. I do believe that he didn't know that that was what that was for. Especially when you look at it, it's a 30 foot by 30 foot slab of concrete. It's a huge area. So I'm sure she told him, oh, I want to build a patio back there. So I need you to dig me a hole and level this and then put some concrete on top of it. 30 feet, you wouldn't be thinking it's a, it's a body going in there. Exactly. So James went out and dug up this area. And this is my speculation on this part, but I believe that Dee Dee then came in and put Abraham's body into said grave, for lack of a better word. And then James shows up another day, lays the concrete slab goes on about his life. And Abraham stayed under that slab until the 25th of January in 2010. Nine months after people lost communication with him. And unfortunately, because of the state of his body, we can't even tell you when he actually died. Because the police believe that any communication that happened in early April 
could have very well just been Dee Dee. <sighs> so after this body is discovered, Dee Dee calls the police. And Dee Dee tells the police, I didn't kill anybody, but I know who did. So with this call, the police bring Dee Dee in for interrogation and shouts out to Red Tree Crime for this interrogation footage. But Cam, it is infuriating. Dee Dee is literally in there saying, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. Nothing happened. I just, I was just a witness. I was just a witness and this horrible crime happened. And she changes her story at least four times in one interview. Wow. You got to go in there and stick with it. Right. Sign that you're lying. Right. Because the truth, the truth doesn't change. If you're telling the truth, the truth is always consistent. So the first story is that Abraham was affiliated with drugs and gangs. And he was shot and killed in a drug deal gone wrong. And Dee Dee witnessed the whole thing. But for some reason, they didn't also just kill her and bury her under the concrete slab next to him. Right. The next story is, she says the cousin that actually reported Abraham missing killed Abraham and stole his money. And he only called the police because he was starting to feel guilty. And again, Dee Dee witnessed this, so she knew that the cousin did this. Third story, Dee Dee says... Well, actually, no, I'm lying. My bad. The numbers are off now. The first story was actually that Abraham wasn't dead. <laughs> Abraham's not dead. I don't know who y'all found in my backyard, but that's not Abraham. Abraham is just fine. I talked to Abraham two days ago. Abraham's just fine. That was actually story number one. Excuse me. And when the police were like, shut up. <laughs> that's not true. This is Abraham. That's when we got these other stories. And the final story, which is both my favorite and least favorite, and you'll understand why, is that Abraham, kind, sweet, gentle, introverted Abraham, confronted her about the money she had stolen from him and was attacking Dee Dee. And the attack was so violent that her son stepped in and shot Abraham to protect his mother. How old is her son? Her son is 13. So she's scapegoating him because she knows that if he does get convicted, he'll go to life or sentence. If I'm a son, I'm like, yo, what? Right. You just pin a murder on me? A, a murder. A murder. A person's death. BFFR! <laughs> And again, like your stories don't make any sense because also everybody knows that Abraham is straight edge. So he doesn't use drugs or alcohol. Everybody knows that. Yeah. So it's just this, this woman absurd. And what's so funny about the interrogation is the officers, the more times her story changes, the more angry the officers get. And at one point, this officer is standing over her screaming in her face you know you killed him. You know you're full of shit. Quote. And it is the funniest thing I've ever seen because she tries to pull out the, you know, you ever heard somebody pretend to cry and they're not actually crying? So she's sitting there and she's talking like this and she just, <laughs> the whole thing, not a tear in sight, not a tear in sight. She's pretending to be hysterical and the police aren't buying it. And she only does this when the police yell at her. When good cop's not yelling at her, she doesn't do all this. But when bad cop is yelling at her, she's, ah, ah, ah. she's like the whole, whole thing. Of course. But here's the best part about the, and, and here's the funniest part about all this. Even after all of that, after all her story changes, after everything that doesn't make sense, they let her go. Because they technically don't have enough to hold her and they don't have an arrest warrant. So they let her go and this is in, you know, late January. She has a couple of days to pull her life together before she is arrested 
on the 2nd of February and she was charged with first degree murder. And of course, she pled not guilty. So she went on trial in 2012 and the defense went with one of her many stories of drug dealers coming in and killing Abraham because of a drug deal gone bad. That's the story she went with, okay. And she doesn't testify in her trial, but the judge reprimands her several times because she's making a scene from her bench. She's making faces, she's crying, she's doing all these antics and stuff. If you don't know this, when you're a defendant or anybody in a court case, you are not supposed to react to anything that is said about you in your case. You can be removed from the courtroom for doing so. And the judge reprimanded her several times, telling her, stop reacting or you will be escorted out. Stop doing this or you will be escorted out. Do that again and I will escort you out. And of course, she's a drama queen. She's like, my ankle restraints are too tight and they're causing me pain. And she's pretending to go into anaphylactic shock at one point. Pulling out the stops. Pulling out all the stops to delay the inevitable. And this is really not that important, but I do want to talk about this, is that Miss Ma'am apparently tried to seduce officers to get out of her charges. And three separate officers testified in her trial. And I'm assuming this is all about character evidence and like the investigation about how she was telling them that, oh, I can go get a hotel room and we can make all these things go away. Or she told one officer, you're not going to get that officer that was yelling at her, the officer that was yelling at her, um, she tells him, you're not going to yell at me. You're going to have sex with me. And after I beat these charges, I would like us to go on a date. The sad part is, it is some men that would, that would take it, though. So she's going with, this is a drug deal gone bad. The prosecution is going with, you know, evidence. And the jury comes back and they find Miss Doris D.D. Moore guilty of first degree murder which is a mandatory life sentence in the state of Florida. So she will be spending the rest of her life in prison without parole. Now, she maintains her innocence to this day on everything, not just the murder, including the fraud, the forging of his name, everything. The murder, okay, sure, you didn't do it. But the fraud, girl, like, who else would have benefited? And I'm going to put in a little clip right now just so you guys can hear how unaccountable she is for her actions did you bury him in your backyard absolutely not why are you laughing because a, a man is dead he's been murdered yes, clearly yes and you're laughing yeah because i find it entertaining that people are that ignorant god knows i'm innocent that is one person that knows i'm innocent i think people are complete idiots that think i had anything to do with it okay I'll be an idiot. I'm willing to be an idiot today. And that is the end of our story, friend. I will say, like, as we mentioned before, it is so unfortunate that it took seven months for somebody to even notice that something had happened to him. For somebody to even notice that something was a little bit off. The fact that it took that long is very sad. The fact that Didi took advantage of his situation is even sadder. And clearly she did not see the humanity in him. She saw him as a walking, breathing check. I am so sad that he had to even go through that. Like, even living, he didn't feel like anybody was on his side. And he finally found somebody who he thought was on his side. And that person was as against him as anybody else, even more. Other people wanted his money. She wanted his money and his life. And she's not even remorseful, which is sad too. And that's the thing that's always so crazy to me is you kill a son, a father, and you show no remorse. Because the reality situation is, sweetheart, let's say based on your definition, I decide to be smart and say you didn't do it. And each one of your versions of this crime 
You were present and you didn't call police. You didn't make any effort to save him, anything like that. But he's buried under your backyard and I'm the idiot. Right. I hope his family is doing okay. And I hope that they've reflected not only on the person he was when he was alive, but the pain that comes with losing somebody that you loved. Because it's hard, regardless of what the state of that relationship is, it's hard. Yeah, it's it's so sad because, you know me, I, I want to see anybody Black win. And it just felt like he finally got a chance to better his life and put himself on the right track. And you took that from him and he didn't deserve that. His spirit, who he was, who he, who he has been described to be, didn't deserve that. Thank you to our listeners for joining us on this episode. I'd also like to thank Red Tree Crime as well as Mike from that chapter for providing most of the material for this episode. If you'd like to check out photos related to this case, please be sure to follow us at Criminalish Podcast on Instagram and TikTok. Listeners, if you like what you hear, be sure to leave us a five-star review wherever you're listening to the Criminalish Podcast. And if you are listening on Spotify, feel free to leave any comments or questions. As always, stay nosy, my friends. Bye. Bye.